I think we can go ahead and get started with our formal meeting uh, this morning. Um, I want to welcome everyone who is participating uh, to an, another meeting of uh, the, first, the First Friday Breakfast Club, uh, an association of gay and bisexual and transgendered men, uh, and the largest private breakfast club uh, in the state of Iowa. Um, we have been in existence since <clears throat> uh, 1996, and one of the uh, one of the things that we do is raise money for scholarships that are given to Iowa high school students, um, regardless of gender, gender orientation, uh, trans status. Uh, but Iowa high school seniors who have done something truly significant to reduce homophobia. Uh, or to teach about LGBTQ uh, issues in their schools and communities. And um, at this point, we have uh, raised um, over uh, $300,000 for scholarships. Uh, it's a remarkable thing. Uh, but the real strength of the program is the opportunity that we have to send a representative to the Iowa, to the high school students' graduation ceremony uh, to present the Fellowship uh, in front of an audience, oftentimes uh, that thinks they've never seen a real person before. Uh, and the responses have been quite remarkable and uniformly positive. Uh, and uh, I want to thank uh, uh, David Cotton for hosting uh, the uh, Zoom meeting uh, to enable us to meet, even though we are not meeting in person. Um, I know all of us would like to be back where we could uh, meet again in person, and we hope to get there soon, uh, but uh, we're going to be guided by uh, the mess best information available uh, for uh, such a gathering, uh, and a decision has not yet been made about uh, October, our meeting in October, um, but uh, I think it likely that we will be a virtual uh, meeting in October as well. Um, let's see, I wanted to check and see if um, a young man by the name of Chris Cuspet is participating this morning. Is he on, David? I uh, don't see one with someone with that name, no. Okay, all right, well, um, never mind then. Uh, I had thought that he might be uh, going to be here, uh, and, and, um, and no problem. I was going to ask him to say a couple of things about his contact information. He's working with either the Action Campaign or the Green, Greenfield Campaign. I'm not sure which, but I was going to get contact information from him uh, to share with any of you who may uh, want to uh, interface with either of those campaigns. Uh, next, I'd like to just acknowledge, uh, I don't think I've acknowledged this before in, a, in our meeting, um, the contribution by uh, David Cott, Peter Arion, um, of three thousand dollars, a fully funded fellowship, uh, and we're very good for that, David. Thank you. Um, also, um, I want to reiterate. I think I mentioned, but I want to reiterate that we have now received uh, and deposited in an earmarked uh, investment account with the Community Foundation uh, a bequest from longtime FFBC member Cliff Paulson. Uh, in, just in excess of $67,000. Um, and uh, that makes uh, Cliff Paulson uh, the largest single contributor uh, to uh, the scholarship program. Uh, until his bequest was received, um, Fred Phelps was the uh, highest contributor uh, from his demonstration time in Iowa, uh, where we turned it uh, into a fundraiser. And he accounted for something like twenty-two or three thousand dollars in funding for the scholarship program uh, and he was number one uh, <laughs> until uh, Cliff Paulson's bequest. Also in terms of uh, opportunities to contribute to FFBC, I want to remind everyone you can go to, if you do Amazon shopping, you can access Amazon by going to smile.amazon.com and then at no cost to you, um, you can shop there just like you can on a regular amazon.com address. Um, you can designate uh, the First Friday Breakfast Club as a beneficiary and um, 
and Amazon will uh, send a check uh, cumulatively of everybody else who has similarly designated MFBC uh, to us and we are able then uh, to maintain financial viability and avoid raising dues. Uh, so you can try smile.amazon.com. Also, uh, many of you are encouraged by your employers uh, to, um, to give to United Way. Uh, most employers are trying to maximize the percentage of employees that are participating. Uh, I know um, our law firm is no different. Um, and I just want to remind everybody that when you fill out the pledge form for United Way, uh, you can designate First Friday Breakfast Club uh, as a beneficiary. And in that situation, uh, number one, FFBC is eligible and qualified uh, with United Way, and number, but it's not funded by United Way. Uh, and, uh, and what you contribute uh, is still just as tax deductible to the extent uh, of a tax deductible contribution. Uh, and uh, uh, that fulfills sort of two birds with one stone. You've been satisfied your employer for participating and your contribution uh, funnels through to First Friday Breakfast Club. Uh, next, um, our newsletter. Uh, our ne next newsletter deadline will be October the 12th. So for those of you who are regular contributors to the newsletter, so that's our next copy deadline. Uh, and, um, and every one of you who is on this, in this meeting is welcome to submit copy for the newsletter. If you get it to me by October the 12th, uh, we will do our very best to, pardon? September 12th or October 12th? Uh, let's see, we're meeting, oh, let's see. Um, yeah, good question. Uh, it should be um, we're in we're in September, right? Yeah. Now that was my mistake. So it's the fourteenth, the fourteenth of this month. Yes, thank you, David. Fourteenth of this month is our copy deadline. I'm getting ahead of myself. There. All right. Um, <clears throat> and um, as I think I indicated earlier, we have not yet made a decision for sure. Um, whether the meeting in October will be in person uh, or, or um, virtual, we have those options. And um, I will a little bit later. Uh, our speaker has indicated a willingness to do what they're uh, doing uh, in person or virtual. Um, are there any other? I'm to turn to Susanna DeBaca, uh, who is with um, Business Publications and uh, has been a longtime friend of our community and uh, has been speaker before our, our breakfast club. Uh, and um, because of a particularly close connection, uh, I suggested and she agreed to our speaker uh, this morning. Uh, Susanna? Excellent. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Wonderful. Well, it's nice to see. Yes, I can. Nice to see so many friends. Uh, so hello to those of you I know and to those of you I don't. I hope to get to know you at some point. Um, but I am absolutely delighted that Jonathan um, invited uh, my little brother, Lou Javaka, and I will point out he is my little brother, um, to come speak uh, because he's actually He's actually turned out pretty well. So I'll tell you a little bit about him. Uh, Lou grew up uh, like me, obviously, in Huxley, Iowa on a cattle farm. Um, and I'm very, very proud of his career, but I'm mostly proud of his character. And when you hear about his career, you'll understand that they are very, very closely linked because he is really devoted his entire life to social justice and to fighting for equality uh, for all people, but most in particular with a specialization in something that's really sounds very foreign to most of us, which is slavery and trafficking. So Lou is best known um, for his role for many years as the US ambassador at large to combat human trafficking in persons and 
um, the role as advisor to U.S. Secretary of State. Many of us, including me, did not know that you could be an ambassador if you were not an ambassador to a, com a country, but these are issues ambassadors. Lou may tell you a little bit about that. Um, and his role was to travel all over the world to countless countries to work um, with them about addressing issues of, around slavery and trafficking. He's also well known for being the director of the um, Office of Sex Offenders with another long you know, string of words after it, a very difficult and complicated role in DC. He was the majority counsel to the Committee on the Judiciary for the US House of Representatives. And before that, for over 20 years, he had a very long and storied career in the Department of Justice as a civil rights prosecutor working his way up from being a, an attorney uh, into many, many roles and developing a specialization in hate crimes and trafficking. Uh, when I was younger and lived in New York, Lou used to come up and stay with me um, and sleep on my futon when he was working on cases, cross burnings, uh, people being held in shif ships, uh, individuals um, who were trafficking their own kind. He worked on a momentous case um, involving deaf Mexicans who were essentially um, trafficking each other. Um, and his reputation ultimately landed him in the ambassador position. He is now a senior fellow at Yale um, in the department of uh, modern, I guess, senior fellow in modern slavery and uh, lecturer in law at Yale Law School in history, um, and has really been, um, I guess, become one of the world's foremost experts and advocates to combat slavery and to promote equity. Uh, he was, as I said, grew up here in Iowa, went to Ballard High School, Iowa State, and then Michigan. Um, he learned social justice from his parents. He learned his hard, eth hard work ethic uh, from growing up on a farm and from being in 4-H. Uh, he learned, I think, his passion for equity by growing up Latino in the state of Iowa, by having many gay family members, and by believing that everyone deserved a chance and deserved a place in this world that was equal. Um, I'm very proud that we can claim him as an Iowan. Um, he has won many, many awards. There's, a, I think, a two-page resume. I'll read you just a few of the ones I think are the most impressive um, or most meaningful to him. Recently, it's, it's like two pages. Uh, he was the recipient of Iowa State University Alumni Award, um, which is wonderful. He's been recognized multiple times as one of the most hundred most influential U.S. Hispanics. He received the director's commendation by the Federal Bureau, Bureau of Investigation on and on, but maybe and most importantly in 1985, he won the National 4-H Beef Award. So go Lou. Uh, Louie obviously, oh, Lou has had an amazing career, an important life, but I want you to know that he's also a great bread baker he is a terrific gardener, raises dahlias just like his mother, and he is very, very funny. So without any further ado, I introduce you to my brother, Lou. Oh, that is a wonderful, a wonderful uh, introduction, Susanna. Thank you. Um, you were scared, I, weren't you? You were afraid. I was, I, yeah, yeah, I'm still just a little nervous about what might come out. Um, well, it's, Interesting to, to hear the eulogy um, in person. So that's that's great that I, I'm able to hear what my sister would say if we were in different um, different circumstances. Um, and I'm probably, unfortunately, not going to be able to live up uh, to the the billing of, of being funny because this is a fairly uh, sobering topic that uh, I'm going to tee up for us today. But it's I think something that um, we have to to really uh, work to confront. Um, I'm going to switch over uh, to. Uh, sharing the screen because I'm going to do a little bit of slides, but I promise you this is not um, a German um, medical conference, so I won't just have a bunch of words on the slides and I won't just 
put my head down and read every word on the slides. Um, that is my promise to you for, for this breakfast meeting. Um, but we've got about 20 minutes or so uh, that we'll just uh, run through this concept uh, and uh, talk about this issue of modern slavery um, with a little bit of, of me in it um, as far as uh, kind of my journey through this. Uh, but what I'm gonna challenge all of us to do is to think about how we can take uh, our own journey to freedom. One of the things that we really need to do um, is we need to recognize that whether it was 150 years ago um, when we're talking about uh, chattel slavery in America and ending chattel slavery in America, which Iowa had a, a really important role in, um, or whether it's something that we're talking about today, um, that this is not something uh, that uh, victims are waiting in mutely and in despair for us to come and rescue them, uh, but rather this is something that you know, victims, uh, people who have suffered this crime, if they only had a chance, if they only had an, an ability to uh, make the, the run for it or to get out, uh, to get empowered on their own, um, that they, they are the ones with the power. And I think that's been the, the case with any type of social justice issue. It's the communities themselves uh, that end up taking the power, but they need people to walk with them on that journey to freedom. And that's, I think, the challenge for, that I'm gonna issue for all of us on the call today it's a challenge that I have to issue to myself uh, constantly, um, is am I uh, setting myself up as some kind of a leader or a rescuer um, that makes me feel good about doing this for other people? Um, doing something for other people sometimes so sounds a lot like doing something to other people. Um, so this idea of the journey to freedom that hopefully we'll be able to take uh, this morning uh, can hopefully inspire you to think about how you would walk with uh, the folks uh, who are in modern slavery around the world on their journey to freedom. Uh, so let's uh, see if the screen sharing works. Okay, um, being a lawyer, um, I always start with definitions just so that we know that um, we are on the same, um, the, the same page. And what I do want to say right out the, the bat is that I think a lot of people have uh, words in their heads or visions in their heads when they see this word human trafficking. And, and we'll talk a little bit about that today. I think that there's a very dominant um, way of thinking about human trafficking. Um, and you've seen that in just in the last few weeks and some of the things that have happened around the election. I can't believe I'm actually going to say the word QAnon uh, on, in live and on a uh, website. Um, but, you know, these things that have been uh, floating around, um, whether it's uh, accusing, uh, four years ago, accusing uh, Secretary Clinton and others of being involved in a pedophilia ring, uh, whether it's um, this idea that Wayfair is not a place where you can go and buy uh, home supplies and things like that, but it's a clandestine sex trafficking ring, et cetera. I want to strip away some of, some of this kind of weirdness that we've seen creep in, especially over the last few months around the concept of, of trafficking. Um, first of all, it's not set called sex trafficking, it's called human trafficking. Um, you don't traffic sex, you traffic a person. Um, and then that person ends up having, against their will, um, through coercion, um, they end up having to either perform or continue to perform something, whether that's labor services. It could be in the sex industry, or it could be something totally different. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but I think that at the end of the day, we're talking about a crime, a human rights violation, and the management and acquisition of a labor force. And so uh, you end up, when you're confronting this, you have to think of it in all of those different ways. Um, bad managers usually don't enslave their workers, um, but it is for many people, whether it's in a factory setting or otherwise, it is one of the management tools that they end up using. Uh, and it's a management tool that then ends up tainting everything that it touches. So. As an Iowan and as somebody who took Iowa history in, I think, fifth grade, um, I, I think like many people, um, grew up with this idea that slavery was something that was taken care of uh, in 1865, and it was taken care of by the people who we erected monuments to, uh, the Soldiers and Sailors Monument uh, there by the Capitol. Um, I don't know how many of you uh, remember field trips to the Capitol, but you'd see all of those captured flags that the that those Southerners keep asking for, um, and that, thank goodness, Iowa is not giving back uh, anytime soon. Um, the more that I've done civil rights work, and the more that I've worked on slavery issues, uh, both uh, historical and otherwise, the, the more I, A, 
differentiate between this type of monument and the Confederate monuments that have been in the news lately. Um, and the more I feel like those, uh, those flags need to stay in our Capitol building um, because not only do they represent the sacrifice of Iowans, but they represent, uh, if you look at the letters that Iowans were sending home uh, from the South during the war, Iowans who were very aware that they were fighting because people were enslaved and they needed to do something about it. So, that, so that's kind of the story that I grew up with and I think that many of us grew up with. Uh, but the 13th Amendment, um, which uh, Lincoln, if you saw that movie that Spielberg did a few years ago, I think did a great job of talking about how Lincoln knew that he needed to get a, a constitutional amendment uh, before the shooting stopped because otherwise he would not have had the power as commander in chief to free all of the slaves. And the way that the 13th Amendment was written, sorry for the lawyering uh, for you non-lawyers, but the way the 13th Amendment uh, was written basically tasks us with an ongoing struggle. This is not, it's over today. Rather, it's our fight against it begins today. It's over, it's no longer legal, but then you actually have to go out and do something about it. And so there's a whole series of cases um, that happen uh, afterwards. And a lot of the, the work, especially under the Grant administration, during Reconstruction was actually going out and prosecuting people for trying to re-enslave through sharecropping and other methods, um, folks who had gained their freedom during the war. But it also gives us a way to look at um, exclusion, uh, discrimination, and the equality principle because the 13th Amendment has been interpreted to, to allow us to go after what's called the badges and incidences of slavery. Um, and what's interesting is that is not necessarily something that is limited to simply the community that was enslaved under chattel slavery. It's not just for the black community. It's broader than that. Um, and it was not only the basis for the updates of the slavery statutes in 2000, but in 2009 was the basis of the Matthew Shepard Act, uh, which actually allowed us to extend hate crimes protections to LGBTQ communities. Um, that's done under the 13th Amendment. Um, and I think it's really important for us to realize but the 13th Amendment doesn't just protect uh, black folks in 1865. The 13th Amendment doesn't just protect immigrants today. The 13th Amendment protects every one of us on this call and every one of us anywhere in the United States. Um, we often think of rights as something that somebody else has um, because we might not need to use them. We might not need to access them. But every one of us has, has those rights. And I think we have to fight for uh, everyone to enjoy them the way that we do. I mentioned there's a series of cases, series of cases through uh, the entire 1900s, um, culminating uh, and building up to um, kind of a, a, a real push in the 1980s um, that made it through from the Carter to the Reagan administrations. Um, what's interesting to me is that, the, is that the waves of enforcement that would happen over those 100 years often represented the inclusion of new groups in the legal community. Um, so under Theodore Roosevelt, uh, the person who they brought in to deal with enslavement of Italian uh, immigrants uh, on railroad building um, was also one of the first female lawyers in the country, and she was the first female federal prosecutor, Mary Grace Quackenboss. Um, you have the same thing happening in the 70s and 80s when you have African Americans, women, uh, and Hispanics coming into the Justice Department and seeing these cases in a new way and then innovating uh, and doing them. I think it, it really, to me, shows uh, how important diversity in the professions are because we also then see uh, diverse and unusual approaches. And we certainly see this uh, in the 1990s, uh, the Flores case uh, coming uh, as it did uh, right as uh, Tom Perez, who some of you may know uh, from his role now with the uh, Democratic National Com Committee, um, Tom Perez becoming the first uh, Hispanic deputy in my office, um, and then tapping me and Leon Rodriguez to go and uh, deal with the farm worker uh, cases that were bubbling up in the South. Um, I do think that you know the fact that we had, you know, for the first time, uh, a, a uh, core group of Latino uh, lawyers in the Justice Department. Uh, it is not a surprise then that we started being able to address uh, cases of farm worker abuse. And the Flores case, that's Miguel Flores right there. Uh, the Flores case was kind of the classic um, case of, um, the classic case of, of migrant worker 
enslavement in the American Southeast. There had been a switch in the 1980s uh, from African American labor to immigrant labor um, as the black community had been able to uh, finally, uh, after 100 years, uh, move uh, into the gains of the civil rights movement. Uh, and so what we saw was that the growers started bringing in uh, Latinos, whether it was Mexicans or whether it was uh, indigenous folks from the Central America to pick the crops. Uh, much is what happened in the late 1990s and early 2000s in Iowa uh, when the detasseling crews suddenly stopped being all of the kids from town and instead uh, ended up starting uh, to be uh, folks from uh, Mexico and other places. But simultaneously we saw <coughs> similar things happening in other countries. Um, the fall of the Soviet empire uh, ended up having a big westward flow of folks for the first time in uh, three generations. Um, and what's interesting is it was noticed first um, as a female um, problem. It was noticed as, you know, strip clubs and forced prostitution and, and things like that. You see this horribly, I probably will stop using this slide at some point, but it's one of the few slides that actually has the, it doesn't have uh, scantily clad women uh, on them. Uh, the, back in the 90s, that was a big thing to kind of over-sexualize uh, the thing. But this idea of the quote-unquote Natasha trade, um, the reality was, and when you look back on it, um, it was also men. It was men from uh, Eastern Europe who ended up on construction sites uh, in Spain, and, and um, it was uh, men and boys uh, who ended up in sex trafficking, just like uh, the women and girls uh, from Eastern Europe. But uh, at that point, people were thinking about uh, trafficking in women a very old and a very familiar term. And so this idea, and we were able to fight back during the, the Clinton administration and say, no, let's go with trafficking in persons instead of trafficking in women. Um, and we kind of ended up having to take that and overlay it with the involuntary servitude and slavery program where those cases that I had mentioned, those cases in the fields and otherwise were being done. Um, and so this very high tech poster um, is, was the first thing that we did. Um, and literally um, we ended up standing around uh, somebody's computer who knew how to use uh, some very rudimentary um, uh, graphics programs. And that became the first uh, Justice Department uh, uh, thing. And the photographs of uh, eyes that we used to represent it uh, were pretty much uh, our paralegals uh, in my office. And they became famous uh, by having their eyes in the poster. Um, but I think that, you know, what you see is, you know, with this, this idea of slavery and trafficking starting to, to be used as an interchangeable term. As a result, we were able in 2000, uh, through uh, the leadership of Paul Wellstone uh, and, uh, and others, uh, to pass the Trafficking Victims Protection Act. And that basically comes in and it's radical. Um, it updates the slavery statutes, but it also does something that's unusual for a federal law is it came in and it said, there's gonna be a new approach. Prosecution alone is not what uh, we're looking at. We have to look at prevention, but even more so, we have to look at protection of the victims. Um, and so there became a way for people to stay in the United States, even if they'd come here illegally, um, and a way for them to access benefits that they weren't entitled to uh, after the welfare reforms of the 1990s. Uh, there's infrastructure, grants, uh, et cetera, um, and uh, probably most importantly, certainly important for my uh, future uh, uh, employment was uh, that it created uh, an office at the State Department uh, and mandated diplomatic engagement. Um, I think one of the things that uh, Secretary Clinton pointed out uh, at a, some event that we were at uh, when I was ambassador was uh, that because I did a lot of the work on, on writing this bill, uh, for the Justice Department. Um, and as she pointed out, if I'd known that I was gonna run the office, I probably would have written uh, some of it a little bit differently. Um, but what we see is the creation of the uh, Trafficking in Persons Office. And so the, those local approaches of doing those cases, of making those posters by ourselves uh, and uh, doing it kind of as on the fly, um, suddenly becomes uh, a infrastructure. Um, and it's an infrastructure that has at its base this idea of empowering uh, the communities uh, through prevention uh, and protection. Um, so we're talking about something that is a global problem. It addressed the problem globally and it addressed the problem locally. And I'll start with globally. Um, so the numbers um, have continued to sharpen um, over the years. We've been able to get 
uh, funding out uh, for prevalence studies, for um, uh, surveys, uh, basically taking um, the same methodology that's used for looking at uh, war crimes or hate crimes or, or other uh, human rights violations. And uh, this idea of modern slavery, again, uh, compelled service, uh, people, people being held, uh, it breaks down uh, very heavily on the, the um, labor trafficking um, as opposed to sex trafficking. And yet the sex trafficking is so lucrative that of the $150 billion um, estimated global um, profit to traffickers uh, every year, about 100 million of that is in uh, sex trafficking. Um, whereas then you have this, the proportions are flipped as far as the raw numbers of people. Um, so more sex trafficking profits, although more labor trafficking victims. And 45 million people, that's bigger than California. Um, we're talking a lot of people around the world. Now, what's interesting is that this is in a world, unlike in 1865, this is in a world where slavery is illegal. Uh, and I think that's really important for us to, to think about it. So while we do have um, state-sponsored slavery, especially uh, in North Korea, and we're seeing uh, really troubling uh, trends in uh, China, especially with the Uyghur genocide. Um, but you know, by and large, you're talking about slavery that is persisting in a world in which slavery is illegal. Um, and so that means it's not hereditary, uh, multi-generational slavery like we think of when we think about chattel slavery of Africans in the United States, um, but rather it's this idea of people using force, using fraud, using coercion to hold somebody against their will. Um, we, and it's important that it's not to kidnap them, it's to hold them against their will. They might have agreed to do it in the first place, um, and then at some point they just want to stop. We all have the right to stop working. Um, you know. At one point, I said this to a foreign audience, they had no idea what I was talking about. Um, I made the joke um, that in the United States, we actually take very seriously your right to take this job and shove it. And nobody reacted. And I had to think, do I try to explain this song or do I just keep going? Um, so this idea of, of where it is. Um, now, where it is, um, you typically will see a lot of imagery like this. This is uh, the tame uh, imagery. Again, I think that there are a lot of people who are drawn to the to the frisson of sex uh, trafficking um, as being dangerous um, and something that they want to deal with, but also it's a little sexy. Um, and I think that one of the things that we see is even uh, things like this. This is in Amsterdam. Uh, everybody, uh, I think, goes straight to uh, white cisgendered women uh, in Europe or the United States as being kind of, you know, who are the, the victims? Uh, but the reality is very different. Uh, the reality is 50-year-old Chinese women in Paris uh, who have no other alternative because they can, you know, can't get hired uh, in a garment factory. Uh, the reality is uh, survival sex for uh, gay boys uh, in Brazil and other parts of Latin America uh, or transgendered uh, folks uh, in Africa or uh, Latin America or in the United States. Um, and the lines are very blurry. Um, and I think that this is... One of the things that we have to really wrestle with is that folks who want to be compassionate uh, to people in the sex industry sometimes will then actually go too far uh, and assume that everyone that is in the sex industry is acting uh, because they're enslaved, not because they have agency. And we certainly know that there are a number of people who for a variety of reasons uh, may uh, decide to be in the sex industry. Um, it's the hard part then is to try to figure out who is truly doing it um, voluntarily, uh, and who is doing it against their will. But sex trafficking, again, is only a small percentage of the, the global cases. It's also more um, feminized. It's more uh, vulnerable types of labor, like uh, domestic servants, nursing, um, these parts of the economy. This is an uh, ad from a paper um, in um, Malaysia. Um, and, you know, I'm not even going to give them credit for not speaking English well, because this is an English language paper and they speak English very well. They knew exactly what they were, what they were advertising here. Um, and, you know, that unfortunately, um, you know, is uh, all too common, uh, not only in around the world, but we've had cases even in uh, the Midwest, in uh, Wisconsin. I don't think we've had a domestic servant case in Iowa yet, but in Wisconsin uh, and um, uh, Minnesota, we've had cases uh, with domestic servants uh, who 
have been abused and held in the house, uh, forced to work, etc. cetera. Um, it's also in the construction industry. Um, and sometimes you can see from this, is, you know, it can be in a place that looks clean. Um, it can be in a place that even has safety equipment. You see, uh, this guy's wearing all the right safety equipment. Um, but at the same time, if his passport was taken, if he owes a, a debt to the recruiters to have gotten the job um, and is working through coercive force, that's a situation of enslavement. Um, it's the mining. Uh, we call it artisanal mining, which is a, a great euphemism. Um, it's basically guys who are being lowered into three or four foot wide holes in the ground in Africa to bring out the coltan uh, and other uh, rare earth minerals that are the reason why we can be on this Zoom call, the reason why our cell phones work, um, because of these uh, low temperature, high, high conductivity minerals um, that are being mined in the Congo uh, and other places uh, by uh, folks like this. And there are, I, I know the photographer, um, and while many of those uh, men um, you know, look like uh, older men, uh, she said that nobody in that photo was uh, over the age of 30. Uh, and the, the guy in front that's looking directly at the camera is very much uh, a teenager. Um, it's palm oil. Um, palm oil that is in pretty much everything. It's not only uh, in um, uh, cosmetics, but it's in the food. Uh, a lot of the food that is processed these days has palm oil in it. Um, and it's even in uh, granite, marble, et cetera, for home building. Um, again, same photographer, um, Lisa Christine, uh, a friend of mine who uh, does work all over the world. Um, these two little brothers um, were about to have to walk down the side of that mountain uh, with that granite uh, in the Himalayas. And that's granite that ends up in the U.S. consumer market. Um, and uh, this idea of basically having to hold, hold themselves together as opposed to uh, where they should be uh, at that age. Um, so that's the global phenomenon. And you know, in Iowa, I think that you know, we very much like to think of ourselves centered in a, in a global um, uh, economy. Um, Iowa is one of the more international states that I've ever uh, lived in as far as people paying attention to the world uh, and being involved in the world, whether it's through their charitable giving or whether it's uh, through uh, the work uh, that we do. And it's, I think it makes sense that the World Food Prize and others uh, have uh, recognized that as far as Iowa is concerned. Uh, but let's bring this down then to the local level, um, because it is a local phenomenon. Um, this is, and uh, we can maybe circulate uh, this slide uh, so that folks have the contact information. These are, uh, it's set up kind of by uh, who uh, in the different regions are the, the groups that are working on human trafficking and kind of who you would call uh, if you either want to get involved uh, or if you uh, had somebody that needed to be uh, helped. But it shows that there are um, folks around the, the state that are working with trafficking victims uh, in Iowa. Uh, so this idea of modern slavery uh, being something that is over there in the palm oil plantations of Indonesia uh, or in the artisanal mines of Africa, um, you know, these groups are working uh, day in and day out uh, with trafficking victims right here at home. Um, and the U.S. Attorney's Office is doing cases. Um, there's been uh, a tranche of cases over the last 10, 15 years. Um, the one thing that I will, um, and they're, they're very righteous cases, um, they're uh, a lot of uh, abuse, a lot of folks have been uh, helped, um, and a lot of uh, bad, really bad guys have been uh, brought to justice. But I will point out uh, that they're almost exclusively sex trafficking, um, almost exclusively African American defendants. Um, and, you know, I think that that's something that we have to be thinking about, you know, if it could be that, you know, that's who's doing the trafficking. Uh, but it could be that that's who's getting arrested for doing the trafficking. Um, and I think we have to always interrogate uh, when we see those kind of, of uh, uh, dichotomies in the numbers. And it also could be that the U.S. Attorney's Office and the, the uh, AG's Office and the, the folks from um, the, folks from, uh, the various uh, organizations in Iowa um, are acting this way because they're acting in a context in which that is the kind of the dominant image uh, or the dominant thought uh, of what human trafficking is in Iowa. Um, if you kind of unpack this uh, slide, you you know you see uh, that it's faith-based uh, with a um, community church, not necessarily a, a mainline Protestant uh, congregation. Um, it's uh, seen very much as a problem affecting young 
white, blonde girls. Um, and uh, it's this assumption of uh, basically, you know, kidnapping or um, chaining up as opposed to uh, people who might have run away, people who might have uh, gone with uh, a pimp because they think that they're in love or that that person might give them a better life. Um, it also uh, demonstrates, I think, the overlap between a number of related issues. Um, the fact that Noreen Gosh uh, was, is involved, the missing and exploited children uh, issue uh, is something that uh, sits next to this. And sometimes um, I think people confuse those two. Um, the idea of the Garden Gate Restoration Home for Women being involved, again, domestic violence and sexual violence efforts uh, sit next to this. Um, and I think it's one of those things that we always have to be uh, interrogating again. What are our assumptions? And while we need to be aware of and finding those girls from Iowa and helping them uh, on their journey to freedom, we also need to not then drive by the other situations. I think that uh, we are often so blinded by that vision of the kind of the, the white girl in trouble um, that we don't then see the developmentally disabled men um, that, for instance, who were uh, found over in Adelisa uh, they were found in plain sight. Everybody in Adelisa had known the, the boys, as they called them, um, forever. Um, these men were brought up from Texas. They were uh, there for 20, 30 years, um, living in this old, man, this old school um, and uh, working in a turkey operation. Um, this was the largest case, not only the largest case in Iowa, but this is the largest civil verdict in the history of the United States for um, enslavement um, brought by the Equal uh, Employment Opportunity Commission, the EOC, uh, and got $240 million in damages. And it kind of happened in plain sight. The Texas, um, the Texas state health system had basically was paying the defendants to take care of these men, rather because with the deinstitutionalizing of uh, folks in the 1980s, um, a lot of uh, these guys who had been uh, in, I guess, their equivalent of the Woodward State Hospital in Texas, uh, then were kind of out on the street. And uh, th these people came in and they not only were using them in, a, in the turkey operation, but they were getting money through Medicare and other things purporting to take, be taking care of uh, these men who were developmentally disabled. Um, so I think it's something that we have to keep our eye open because um, while the previous um, image is, I think, what a lot of people want to see, um, the desire to see that uh, maybe sometimes blinds us uh, to what might be in our own communities. Um, so solutions, what can be done? Um, to me and, and hearing from Susanna about the work of the breakfast group, um, you know, I think that was one of the most important things for me is that I know that you guys are all uh, very solutions oriented and I wanna leave everyone with uh, something other than simply coming and saying, good morning, slavery still exists now that everybody's um, kind of shattered by that. Um, I'll see you later. Uh, rather, um, what are the, th the things that are going on out there? There are some exciting things going on out there, frankly. Um, this uh, boat, the Tunigo number 61, was the first, um, the first boat to be delisted by Customs and Border Protection under the new uh, Tariff Act changes. Um, one of the things that we've seen is that uh, despite all of the everything else that's going on, that there still continues to be some kind of a rough consensus around this issue between the administrations. Um, the Tariff Act changes from 2016, um, the executive order on government procurement saying that the government is not going to buy um, anything that's tainted by slavery. Um, those have survived into the Trump administration and not, have, not only have survived, but Customs and Border Protection is uh, enforcing them. Even uh, in the middle of a pandemic, when we needed uh, personal protective gear, um, the folks over at CBP were not afraid uh, to sanction uh, one of the largest medical supply companies in the world, Top Glove, uh, who had slavery in their Malaysian factories. And you better believe that the Malaysian factories suddenly came up with a lot of back wages for the workers, the, where they had the passports locked up suddenly got unlocked and the passports given back to the workers all sorts of remedial things because they did not want to be locked from the US market. Um, so that's one of the things that we see a structural solution um, that comes out of the Obama administration uh, and has been continued to their credit by the Trump administration. Uh, another structural um, uh, 
uh, solution, a systemic solution that I'm very excited about uh, is the Fair Food um, uh, Program, uh, which is the response that was put together by Miguel Flores' victims. You remember Miguel Flores from the earlier slide. Um, that not only was a case that became the model for a lot of what we did uh, in this fight, working with community groups, working with the church, working with uh, immigrant rights uh, folks, uh, but also uh, they then went on uh, to form the Coalition of Immokalee Workers. Immokalee is a town in Western Florida that's had a slavery problem um, forever. Uh, Edward R. Murrow uh, had a famous documentary in 1961 about the slavery problems in Immokalee with the African-American community. Um, there were cases in the 40s where the FBI tried to unsuccessfully uh, stand up to uh, U.S. sugar uh, for what they were doing, recruiting kids, black kids from Memphis and taking them out uh, to the fields in Florida. Uh, and there was slavery in those fields back when slavery was legal before 1865. Um, but one of the things that we've seen is that now, um, because of the last 20 years worth of work with the Coalition of Immokalee Workers, uh, we're going on six or seven years with no slavery cases. Um, and it's because of the Fair Food Standards Council. They went to uh, Walmart, they went to Whole Foods, they went to Amazon. Some of you may remember um, about 15 years ago, 15, 20 years ago, they had gone after Taco Bell and they uh, had have been uh, picketing Taco Bell and, and uh, trying to get everybody to, to not eat the, the tacos. Um, and their slogan was, yo no quiero Taco Bell, as opposed to yo quiero Taco Bell. Uh, what's happened is that they've become kind of the model of this thing called worker-led social responsibility. Um, and so the workers themselves are the ones uh, who are driving it. What we've seen, and this is why I'm so glad that they have a, a, a woman um, as the tomato picker on their logo. What we've seen though is that this thing that was supposed to be about slavery, that was supposed to be about wage theft, that was supposed to end this problem of human trafficking in the fields, has actually had another effect that nobody had expected, which is that systemic sexual harassment uh, and sexual abuse in the fields um, has gone away. Um, and you end up having male workers in the fields who are actually calling the hotline saying, I'm not comfortable with the way that the manager is treating the women on my crew. Um, now speaking, um, you know, as a, a U.S. Latino male, um, I will say that um, there is a reputation out there of macho culture. Um, and so when you end up having uh, farm workers who are picking up the phone on behalf of uh, their female counterparts and saying that they are not uh, comfortable with sexual harassment, I think it, it for me, it resonates uh, as far as just how uh, worker-led social responsibility uh, is making a cultural shift uh, within the farm worker community and within the grower community. The growers recognize now that they are actually uh, getting better, um, they're getting better product, they're getting a committed workforce that is staying, that's not go picking up and leaving um, because they are becoming employers of choice by participating uh, in this. Um, it's left Florida and it's going around the country, um, up the coasts um, and uh, it's crossed the Mississippi. It's uh, got some pilot projects in Texas. Um, I would love it if it eventually gets up to, to the upper Midwest, um, although recognizing that so much of what we do in agriculture in Iowa are not um, truck crops, but are instead uh, more uh, commodity and production agriculture. Although that does seem like it's changing uh, kind of uh, as we speak. Um, and that brings us to Iowa. What can we do at the local level? Um, well, I would certainly, um, if people aren't already involved, um, if you're not involved, it's probably because uh, George Blitzos hasn't uh, decided that you need to be because when George uh, decides that you need to do something, I've known this since I was in high school and, I've, and, and Susanna's known this since she was in high school. Uh, if George decides that, that you would be good uh, at something and that your leadership or your volunteering on that would make a difference, then you can pretty much guess what you're gonna be doing for the next year. Um, this uh, organization, Iowa Network Against Human Trafficking, that came out of YSS originally, um, and really still has Dr. George, uh, which is you know, really uh, uh, pushing. I don't wanna say in the driver's seat, and I don't wanna say uh, leading it, because you know what he does so well is to, is to bring people in uh, to really help uh, them be able to be leaders. Uh, but I also want to make sure that he gets uh, all the credit in the world for this. Um, but this idea of being able to uh, to really engage at the local level. Um, 
But the local level is not enough. And this is the challenge that I'll, I will leave you all with is the personal level. Um, and there's one thing that you can do. It, it's just a start, but it, it's something that I think helps us all. And we all have to come up with kind of those moments of uh, not just being about ourselves. And we have to be reminded, I think, um, you know, especially now in COVID when we're so much living in our own head and our own space. Um, and, you know, that idea of, you know, how do I get involved? How do I get involved with the network against human trafficking? How do I get involved with the groups that are doing stuff overseas? Um, but also, how do I get involved in my own life? Um, we are all buying things uh, made by people who are being abused. Um, we're all, I see a lot of um, both t-shirts and collared shirts uh, on the Zoom call. Um, and those are all hel held together by cotton thread um, and maybe made out of cotton. Um, but that cotton thread is very probably coming from Central Asian republics that basically force all of the teachers and students to go out and work in the cotton fields um, with threat of violence, with threat of imprisonment, um, with beatings from uh, the, the local thugs, uh, et cetera. And so that notion of every one of us being literally touched by slavery, whether it's in the palm oil, uh, in our uh, cosmetics, whether it's in uh, the, the cocoa and coffee that we depend upon uh, to be able to get up and go to, to breakfast meetings with, um, it's there. And it's in our own personal supply chain. So what I'm going to challenge everybody uh, to do, and uh, I'm warned that uh, sometimes it's a little hinky with the difference between HTTP and HTTPS, it only works on the old system, um, is to go to slaveryfootprint.org uh, and ask yourself this question. Um, because everybody on this call, I think, is committed. Uh, to equity, everybody on this call is committed to, to justice. Uh, and yet none of us can ask ourselves that question, how many slaves work for me, and know that nobody is being abused on our behalf. So anyway, that's a quick little tour through uh, this, uh, this issue. Uh, it's a quick little tour through kind of the state of play uh, out there. Um, and I really look forward, not only if we have time for questions, but I really look forward to seeing uh, how you guys end up taking this uh, and how you end up walking on your own journey to freedom. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much, uh, Lewis. Um, and uh, I'll ask if there are any uh, people who have any questions for uh, Ambassador Baca. Anyone? Um, I've got, I've, uh, David, did you have one? Yes, thank you. Uh, it's more of a kind of an international and U.S. policy question. I know when I served in the military, for example, in Saudi Arabia for over a year, there were a lot of guest workers there, which when you talk to them, they didn't have the freedom to go home. So how do we rationalize and how does that discussion take place of our national policy and objectives when we're working with a partner that doesn't have that same perspective? What, uh, what's the overwhelming process we go through that when we balance it out, of how we're going to work with that partner or not. Yeah, it's a it's a really important question, uh, Dave. And you know, twofold. I mean, first of all, one of the things that we were able to do during the Bush administration was to get extraterritorial jurisdiction um, written into the law, and then in the Obama administration, uh, being able to get um, the contracting standards uh, set up so that our own contracts could be uh, free from forced labor and services, because we ended up having a number of folks that were in support roles uh, who were being uh, enslaved. Um, you had women from Tonga who were in uh, north of Irbil in on a, on a front line um, a, a front line firing base, um, living in a a shipping container cutting hair. Um, and those women thought that they were going to um, Qatar to work uh, in a high end salon. Um, instead, they end up you know getting in country and. At least they were given a, a, um, a helmet and, and some uh, body armor, but they were you know, like, what am I doing here? Um, and so one of the things that we saw, and DOD was a real leader on this, is you know, the idea of first look at our own um, issues. Um, and so you started having uh, more investigations being done, the contracting standards, you know, et cetera. Um, but then you know, we're cheek and jowl with our, our allies. And the allied conversations are in some ways harder than the ones uh, with countries that we aren't necessarily aligned with. 
um, you know, going and yelling at, you know, the Congolese uh, government is a lot easier than uh, going and yelling at Botswana, um, you know, who's a close partner in a lot of things. Um, the same thing with Denmark. Um, my uh, friend Rufus, who was ambassador there, you know, he said it was always tough because, you know, we were so aligned with them on human rights issues. And then we'd go in and say, well, the one thing you're not doing well is dealing with these trafficking victims. Um, you might have a little bit of a racism problem, uh, Denmark. <laughs> and that was hard because, you know, we were relying on Denmark for so many other, whether it's LGBT issues, whether it's um, freedom of the press issues, you know, et cetera. Uh, and then there's those places that are, that we know aren't doing well um, and our close allies, um, you know, whether it's the Saudis, whether it's the Omanis, the Omanis were very aggressive. Um, in fact, they uh, at kind of at the height of the shooting uh, in 05 through 07, um, they stopped letting us uh, refuel um, some of our ships uh, in Muscat um, because we were putting the heat on them as far as uh, what they were doing with their, their domestic servants and what they were doing with their construction workers. Um, I think that's part of the, the willingness. You know, have to be willing to, to bring the heat. Um, you know, not let people off the, the hook. Every year we do a, a ranking of how a country is doing. Um, and frankly, there have been a few kind of disquieting, um, disquieting rankings of, that maybe don't always fully match the facts on the ground. Um, you know, it was a real struggle um, throughout the years uh, to... And we always were able to put them on tier three because they were a tier three country. But man, that Uz Uzbekistan ranking, um, when the Northern supply route to Afghanistan ran through Uzbekistan. And you know that is a real foreign policy issue. You have to balance those things. We needed the material and we needed the ammunition uh, to get into Afghanistan for our guys. And it had to go through Uzbekistan. Um, and yet Uzbekistan was enslaving all those children in cotton. Um, I was lucky enough to work in an administration that um, was proud to, to uh, walk and chew gum on these issues at the same time. Um, and you ended up having folks, uh, whether it's uh, from the commands uh, or whether it's uh, from the kind of quote unquote harder, part, uh, harder parts of foreign policy, um, who would raise them. Uh, Vice President Biden uh, sent back a note one time on a briefing for a, a allied country in Eastern Europe um, where the slavery problem had said, if raised. And so if they raised it, then he was supposed to respond. And he'd circled and he said, why would I wait until they raise it? If they have a slavery problem, we need to talk to them about it. So. Uh, are, there, uh, are there other questions from, uh, yes, uh, Rick Miller, I see you. Take it off mute. Mm -hmm. um, I have two real quick questions. One is that, um, a lot was done with COVID in these packing houses, which seemed to almost enslave the workers there because they were required to go to work in areas where there were high degrees of um, COVID exposure and, um, and actually catching the disease. I'm curious about your um, take on that because it's partially an immigration issue too. And then what happened in Northwest Iowa with the Nunes situation? Congressman Nunes ha is, uh, has some large dairy operations in Northwest Iowa. And I know that some reporters were trying to report on what was going on with immigrant labor there. Do you have any information on that? Yeah, I think it's a great um, question. You know, one of the two things, the dairy has been, and I seem to recall that there was, um, that there were some H visas um, involved, H visa, or these guest worker visas um, that a lot of folks in dairy uh, end up using uh, to bring in um, folks uh, from, especially Mexico. Um, and my, I know that the Nunez family operations have used guest workers. I can't recall uh, whether they're Iowa operation. You know, there's that famous, are they located in Iowa? Or are they located in California? Exactly. Uh, problem. <laughs> um, but you know, it, I think it. It and the, the stuff in the meatpacking plants, I think, goes to one of the challenges in working on this, um, which is we're really talking about a spectrum of exploitation. And the worst forms of it end up crossing the line over into being flat out slavery. Somebody's been, uh, you know, their passport's been taken, they've been told straight out, I will deport you if you don't do X, Y, or Z. Um, 
but then there's a lot of other things that I don't even want to say that they're quote unquote lawful, but awful. Um, but they may not be criminal. They might be administrative. And so you have the, whether it's the wage hour protections or the need to have unionization, you know, a lot of those things, if you're looking at the spectrum, they're the things that don't necessarily rise over that level. Um, it's kind of like the, in criminal law, um, you know, somebody who is verbally abusive versus um, hits you versus tries to kill you versus actually kills you. Those are different levels that as lawyers, we end up slicing and dicing. But I think that one of the problems, especially in, in meatpacking, is that that slicing and dicing, no pun intended, um, but the slicing and dicing of the types of um, abuse have basically allowed everybody to say, okay, well, if it's only this, then that's Department of Labor. If it's only this, then that's Department of Health. If it's only this, then you know, if you get hit at work, well, then your, your local sheriff you know, will deal with it, except for the fact that nobody in the sheriff's office actually speaks Spanish and, and everybody is afraid that you're going to turn them over to immigration. Um, and you know, it becomes that cascade of it's everybody's problem, and so therefore it's nobody's problem. I do think that one of the things that's going to change that, frankly, and it's just taking time, um, and Susanna and I and, and others, I think, are impatient on this because we thought it had happened quicker, is that you know, we are starting to see a, a, younger, um, a younger cohort of Iowa-born Latino, uh, I call them kids now, but they're you know, in their 20s at this point, um, you know, of folks who are, who are starting to you know, kind of stand up for themselves and for their parents in ways that their parents um, whether it was culturally or whether it's because of their situation, you know, weren't necessarily prepared to do. And I think that as we find our, our legs um, in the Latino community, um, I think that, you know, standing up uh, against these things ends up being more of a possibility. Uh, but we're talking about an industry that has been a problem since it's existed. Uh, the second that you went from uh, local butchers to meat packing. Uh, this has been a problem. And, you know, the muckrakers uh, in the 1890s um, thought that they were actually writing about the uh, physical abuse and the enslavement of the Eastern European workers in the Chicago stockyards. Um, and famous, the famous quote is, uh, I aim for America's heart and I hit it in the stomach. Uh, because the exposés in the 1890s didn't result in um, better working conditions for the, for the workers themselves, but instead resulted in safety, um, health and safety checks because people were con concerned about bad meat coming out to the consumer. And I don't think much has changed in the last 130 years, unfortunately. Thank you. Are there, are there other questions? Um, we had something from Jim Hardy on the chat, it looks like. Um, Jim said, the mention of coffee made me think of the fair trade products I see. Are they relevant to this issue? You know, that's a, a great question, Jim. And I think that it, it, it's something you might notice that what I didn't put on the, the solutions was certifications. Um, certifications, I think, are important. And certifications are something that we as consumers um, or folks who are doing sourcing uh, would like to see, and we would like to see better certifications. Um, Rainforest Alliance, which does uh, fair trade, um, comes out of the environmental community, and they do a pretty good job on things like deforestation. They do a pretty good job on um, not having uh, basically localized genocide. Um, a fair something as a fair trade product is not going to be coming out of a place where the military has gotten rid of all the villagers uh, so that you can plant more coffee. Um, but I think that because those are the types of things that they were set up to look at, they've been slow to be able to really address uh, these uh, kind of individualized issues of forced labor. And there's a lot of blinders uh, that, have, that have been put on. And so there's a, a new study that just came out uh, from, uh, it's called MSI um, uh, Integrity, which is multi-stakeholder initiative is what MSI stands for. And the MSIs then tend to have these certifications, like the Fair Trade Certification of the Rainforest Alliance, which is the MSI. And the MSI integrity report that came out a, a few weeks ago uh, out of uh, Harvard Law School um, really questions the entire approach because uh, it has been a kind of a very comfortable corporate um, uh, setup. And the best of them, and Fair Trade is, I think, one of the bests of them, uh, the best of them end up 
uh, looking for kind of setting up the cooperative model, just like the cooperatives that we had uh, in Derry, the, the Land O'Lakes and, and you know, the various co-ops uh, that really come out of the progressive era uh, in uh, the upper Midwest. Um, those types of co-ops, uh, whether it's in coffee, whether it's in cocoa, uh, et cetera, those tend to, to uh, be places and markets that don't have uh, as much of this type of abuse. So I would always look for a certification. If you uh, see a certification and you have time to, to kind of go and look and see what they claim they're doing, you know, are they only an environmental uh, certification? Because a lot of them, you know, there was 100% organic cotton certificate certified uh, product coming out of Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan. Um, and suddenly the folks who had been certifying it as organic realized that, to their credit, but it was because the Cotton Coalition uh, and even the apparel manufacturers started turning up the heat on them, uh, that consumers were saying, well, this is great. This is sustainable cotton. Look, it's got this certification. It says it's 100% organic, so it's clean. Because they didn't look at all as to how it was picked and by whom and under what conditions. They were simply looking at what the pesticide load was. So I think that it, what, this is you know, the challenge for all of us on the fair trade thing is uh, we have to work uh, to help them make it better so that we as consumers can actually do what we want, which is to be able to rely on those types of certifications. Um, any other questions that anyone has? I've got one that I would like to touch on. Um, Ambassador, what, if any, has been the impact of the internet and the development of the internet and the uh, broader and broader availability of the internet? How Has that changed the dynamics? Has that had an impact on sort of what this thing is and what the magnitude of the problem is? Yeah, I think there's several things that have happened. Um, and like any technology, there's the good things and there's the bad things. Um, the bad things, um, I think, is that um, it has delocalized uh, markets, especially in the sex industry. Um, and so because of the internet um, and because of, you know, very, it's like Quicksilver, you know, that'll end up finding, you know, finding the, the flaw in the table and then everything will rush over to, to that low spot. Um, folks early on started to see that they could exploit the, the vulnerabilities in the kind of an open source platform like uh, Craigslist. <laughs> and you started having Craigslist get infected by uh, pimps who were using it uh, to uh, turn out um, not just children, but also uh, women and young men uh, who might be uh, held against their will. Um, but at the same time, um, you had folks uh, who were not being controlled, um, who were in the sex industry voluntarily, um, who saw Craigslist or some of the other online sites um, as ways in which they themselves could control uh, their client base, um, scheduling dates, you know, all of those things. Um, and, you know, it's interesting because there's some white hot political um, debates around this. Um, I tend to always come, not just, I don't want to call it, you know, the public health uh, approach, um, but I'm always like, well, let's listen to the people involved um, and let's figure out what the, how we minimize harm. And if you've got somebody who says, well, you know, by me using this particular site, I can end up being less in danger. Um, I'm not on the street. I don't have to use a pimp. Um, I can control and pre-screen my clients. Um, you know, then that part of me, you know, looks at that and says, well, you know, this actually makes sense. There's also that part of me that says, you know, you know let's have a conversation as to whether there might be something else that you could do for a living. Um, and, you know, how can we help you with that? Um, but recognizing, you know, you find people where you find people. There's other folks who, who end up then saying, um, we've got to purge this entire, entirely from the internet, and we have to have an internet that uh, at least as, ostensibly looks as though it's free uh, of any of that. And so there was a, a bill passed a couple of years ago um, called FOSTA. Um, I won't get into all of the, the acronyms, um, but it uh, looked to get rid of uh, and, and put in place ways to go after um, uh, service providers who were allowing kind of online sex platforms, especially Backpage.com. Um, and it's been a mixed bag because, you know, local law enforcement was actually using Backpage.com as a place they'd go on and, and they'd look and they'd see if there were 
pictures of kids that were that looked like children, um, and they would try to go out and then do something about it. And so there's been the real worry that it's been direct driven underground. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't also mention, though, uh, the um, positive aspects of the internet. Um, and I think that one of the things that we're seeing, and a lot of folks are are really looking at this as perhaps a solution, whether it's in sex trafficking or labor trafficking, historically, um, the trafficking part, the, you know, having somebody from another country who's being recruited for an opportunity that ends up being a, a false promise and then trapped and enslaved, often ends up happening because there's a power imbalance between the person who would like to have the opportunity to work in a more uh, quote unquote advanced country or a richer country. They'd like to be able to access that, that higher wage uh, opportunities, what have you, um, or even move to a different part of their own country where they can get that, you know, the, the south, the north to south flow of, of Hill Tribe uh, children uh, and youngsters into Bangkok so that they can not only go to school but get good jobs. Um, Historically, that's been controlled because of the information gap. That's been controlled by labor brokers. It's been controlled by recruiters, the guy who can get you the job. Um, and I think that one, one of the things that we're seeing is that there's alternative ways to find out about things. And the internet um, and technology is breaking the information monopoly that the traffickers have historically ex exploited. Uh, and we saw that, frankly, we saw that in the Flores case. Um, you know, Flores knew uh, the guys in the hills in Guatemala who could go out and tell people you can get a job in construction in, in South Carolina. And then once they got to South Carolina, it wasn't in construction, it was in tomatoes, uh, but it was too late at that point. But those guys had been trapped in that information uh, gap. And I think that anything we can do to, to flatten that out uh, and make it so that just as we've made it uh, in the federal procurement standards, so you don't, uh, if you're doing federal contracting, you can't charge recruiting fees to the workers. Um, that next step, I think, is going to have to be technologically driven. So there's some really exciting things going on out there. There's actually some other things, but um, <clears throat> we don't have an hour uh, to, to go through it. Um, the the slaveryfootprint.com uh, or .org that I had mentioned, one of the exciting tech things out there is that they have now built that out. Um, and there is a, a B2B um, version of that called FRDM because tech companies now have to get rid of all of their vowels. Um, it's some trend that, you know, of naming companies. So Freedom, spelled F-R-D-M, um, is actually a algorithm that will uh, run through a company's spend data. Um, and, you know, you basically give them your um, SAP or um, what have you, uh, procurement stuff, and it'll go and do a crawl at night. Uh, through your spend data, and it'll pop out where you need to be looking. Uh, and so some very big companies, Fortune 50 companies, um, are now starting to use that, uh, which then the general counsel's office, um, they want that information, and they're also kind of annoyed with, you know, now I have to do something, now that you told me that the, you know, that the upholstery on our airplane seats, you know, we didn't know that that was a slavery, slavery risk. Um, you know, so it's, I think we're seeing this opportunity now with things like the Freedom Platform uh, and others to, to really access big data and, and to start to uncover modern slavery. Um, another question. Um, <clears throat> it seems to me that there's a parallel form of slavery uh, in, in the nature of um, gay people being in the closet. Um, and that that is even more aggravated as we get into other countries where it's a crime and, and, and I'm wanting to know if you're familiar with uh, Rainbow Railroad uh, that is, that works, it's an international group that works, we had someone from there uh, speak to our breakfast club some time back, um, gets people spirited out of countries where they are in jeopardy and, and if a person enters into that pipeline, I would think they would be also a prime candidate for being then trafficked in the process. Once you make yourself vulnerable like that, that you're um, uh, in greater danger of being trafficked. Uh, have you had any dealings with that Rainbow Railroad group? You know, I, I know of, the, of that type of effort, but I don't know that group itself. And I'd love to, you know, to, when we get done, if you can uh, link me up with them, I'd love to, to make that linkage. Um, 
You know, but I think that one of the things that we've seen, um, and one of the things that's so important um, in the LGBT community is that the fact of, of living that underground life in a lot of countries, um, people who are people who are out by the, those countries' standards are extremely in by the standards of 2020 America, um, as far as kind of what does the closet look like. Um, and what it does is it ends up becoming, you know, the blackmail uh, and other um, leverage points. Um, and so I think that, you know, what we see is coming out does tend to, to uh, have uh, a effect of kind of, it's a liberating effect that's not simply liberating as, as far as the act of coming out. It's liberating in that it, it removes the vulnerability, not the vulnerability of being gay in that country, but the vulnerability of being closeted gay in that country. Um, unfortunately, one of the things that we often then see, um, and this is more in Latin America, but um, in other places as well, um, is that the only socially acceptable um, expression of one's identity then ends up being in the sex industry. Um, and when I say socially acceptable, I'm talking about socially acceptable in some very constrained, uh, constrained ways. And so the feeding into the kind of when somebody, you know, makes the move, when somebody, you know, leaves home um, and, you know, goes to the city, you know, because of, of Kind of the, the small town dynamic, you know, all of those things that are not just U.S. Um, history, uh, uh, historical things. Uh, often, the community in Latin American cities or in African cities that then is going to bring that person in and help them uh, kind of make the transition into being out um, is the sex worker community, um, and so. There are a lot of people who then say, well, then, you know, that's trafficking. And of course, I look at it as, you know, that is a, pr a process that this person is going through. Um, and it could be that there are traffickers who will then enslave folks in that situation. But, you know, it's trying to figure out, you know, that balance. Um, what's interesting, though, to me is, you know, that it, I think it shows, you know, kind of uh, the challenges that folks have uh, that we're we're now enough generations into um, a integrated civil rights movement with, you know, not only the racial and ethnic groups, but uh, with other groups in the United States, the things that we think of as kind of normal for 2020, uh, we have to really think about uh, our friends and colleagues in other countries uh, as far as just where they are on that journey. Thank you. <clears throat> Jonathan? Yes. Gary here. Just uh, just a couple of uh, real quick comments. Um, you know, we've been lucky enough at the First Friday Breakfast Club to have some, you know, national and international speakers. And um, this morning is a classic example. Here we have a, uh, probably one of the world's experts in, um, in slavery. And um, I think we need to do more about you're talking about what can we do? This presentation this morning was outstanding. The questions that came in were outstanding. I think it's very important that we take advantage of uh, our technology today. And since we do make our our, our speakers available to um, uh, making uh, our, our morning things available to people to listen to later on, I think maybe we can do a little bit more about trying to get people to come in and listen when we have somebody of this caliber explaining things so precisely and so uh, understandably for us to expand our understanding. Uh, I think this would be one good thing to do is for us to try to get this information out by publicizing this speaker and saying you can access this through First Friday Breakfast Club. This is a world-class presentation. Well, Gary, um, I'm not sure because I'm not seeing all of the participant lists, but I, uh, I know my sister's on the phone and I hope my mom is as well because I would <laughs> love for her to have heard what you just said about my presentation. <laughs> Excellent. It's very, it's very powerful and you're very, very precise in what you say. Uh, obviously, you're experienced to 
many years uh, and working in the area is, uh, is, is really a privilege to listen to you speak. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Uh, well, um, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. Um, I want to just remind everybody that the ambassador started out by talking about the journey to freedom uh, and challenged us <clears throat> to think through uh, what we could do to uh, interface with others who are uh, dealing with and concerned about this problem of uh, slavery um, and uh, has given us a number of potential resources that we can access uh, to facilitate that, including uh, slaveryfootprint.org which um, uh, David Cotton put up on our chat screen, if anyone wants uh, a place to remind them of that. Uh, also, he called our attention to the NAHT, uh, the Network Against Human Trafficking, uh, and told about where and how it uh, is accessible. Um, and also there are hotlines, um, both national hotline and an Iowa hotline uh, that uh, are available in Iowa. The hotline is 800-770-1650. So there are ways for us to get involved. And I think it was uh, Ellie Wazell, who uh, was a Peace Prize winner, who said uh, that um, in, in matters of oppression, uh, there is no neutral ground. You either uh, take a position uh, or God Almighty assigns you uh, to the side of the oppressor. Uh, so I think the challenge is to see what we can do uh, ourselves to uh, help here. Um, there are, uh, this is, a, I think, a perfect example of what Gary was talking about. That, uh, with the virtual, one of the virtues of a virtual meeting is we can, we can reach out to, uh, to experts and uh, knowledgeable people, specialized knowledgeable people, um, experienced and successful people, uh, that are geographically remote from us uh, and access uh, their inputs. Uh, this is just a perfect example. It also allows people who are not typically in attendance at our meetings uh, to uh, participate as well. Uh, Connie Weimer, I saw, was on uh, this call, and, and, uh, and that's a perfect example. I want to thank uh, Susanna uh, for uh, telling us about uh, her brother. Uh, in such glowing terms at the outset. And uh, Scott and I said, well, that's got to be a speaker from Breakfast Club. And Susanna said she would do what she needed to do to twist arms or whatever to get him to say yes. Uh, and then uh, thank you also, Susanna, for introducing him this morning. Uh, that was great. Um, remarkable, remarkable achievements that you have had in your career thus far. Um, and I... I like to think your career isn't over and there are other <laughs> great things that are yet uh, to come. Uh, thank you again for being a presenter at FFBC. Um, and as I uh, mentioned, uh, there is a meeting. Our next meeting is going to be on October uh, the 2nd, seven o'clock central time. Our speaker uh, will be none other than Rob Sand, uh, the Iowa State Auditor. Uh, and he has had some remarkable uh, experiences and uh, fairly high pre uh, press coverage um, and he will be our speaker in October uh, whether we are in person or virtual. Uh, the board has not made a final decision about that but it will be communicated to you as soon as the board has made that decision. Um, my suspicion is that it will be vir virtual again uh, but um, uh, Rob Sand has indicated that he would cooperate and, and participate in either format, whatever we felt comfortable with. Uh, and with that, I will ask if there is anything else that needs to be said in closing. If not, I want to thank all of you for participating. We had, um, at this point, a record uh, number of participants for the virtual meetings that we have been doing. Um, and um, so people are figuring out how to do it. Um, and uh, people are generally getting better and better at that kind of virtual uh, participation. And that's great and it does create some opportunities for us. If I hear nothing else, we are adjourned. Thank you again. Thank uh, and you. And Debaca, we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, John.
Jonathan, do you want to uh, stay online for a moment for just a quick discussion? Uh, certainly. Okay.